Born in New York City in 1959, Victoria Riddell is the author of three poetry collections, Woman Without Umbrella from Four Way Books, Swoon from the University of Chicago Press, and Already the World from Kent State University Press. She is also the author of four books of fiction, including the award-winning novel, Lover Boy, from Grey Wolf Press, which was adapted into a feature film in 2005. Riddell has taught writing at Columbia University, Davidson College, The New School, and Vermont College. She has also received fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. She is currently a faculty member at Sarah Lawrence College and lives in New York City. Her craft talk today will be on narrative and collage. So um, welcome, Victoria, to the University of South Alabama and the Stokes Center for Creative Writing. Hi, it is a pleasure to uh, join you even in this weird virtual way that I'm joining. Um, and I kind of only wish that uh, I was in a classroom of people having this conversation so that the conversation we could stop each other. You could ask me questions in the middle, um, but I'm going to kind of plow ahead. Um, I've taken some notes, so I'll read a bit, but mostly I think I'll just try to talk to you and look at the books. So my talk is on process and collage um, in the in narrative form. And um, I'll start by just saying a couple of things. Um, as Becky said, I, I began my life in, in writing as a poet and um, and then somewhere along the way, I wrote a collection of stories. And then I started to work on a novel. And um, I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, and I don't even know why I thought it was a good idea for me to be writing a novel. But it seemed to me that the, the little bit of, of an idea that occurred to me, or the bit of a character that occurred to me really more than an idea, um, was going to need some room. Um, I didn't have any idea about how to write a novel, um, though, uh, like most of us who love uh, words, who love books, I've been reading novels my whole life. Um, so I, I, I had some ideas from the stories I've been working on um, that were, I had this idea of the novel as a very experimental one. So initially I had the image in my mind of a woman who has um, woken in um, a hospital bed, um, uh, she uh, is surprised she's there, but she kind of knows why she's there. We as a reader don't know why she's there. Um, and we know very quickly that she has a child and she doesn't know where that child is. Um, and that's kind of what I knew going in. It was really much less of an idea for a whole project than the image of this woman. Um, and so I, given that she was kind of moving in and out of consciousness, I had this idea um, that I was gonna unfold the book, that paragraph by paragraph would move in time. And so that the, um, the unconscious mind as it, as it questioned things, as it told the story would happen in a super fragmentary way. Um, and I wrote about 30 pages into that um, text. And I thought it was really cool. And then I started to do what um, I think we do when we're working. I, I decided, well, I better check this out and read to myself. So I started to read aloud. And um, not only did it not seem cool when I was reading it aloud, it seemed remarkably boring. I thought, oh my God, how would anyone endure this when I can't endure it? Wasn't that there weren't sentences that I loved? There were, um, but it wasn't unfolding in any way. And I thought I was gonna to have to give up. Um, and someone, another friend said, just write little moments, write little moments the way you write poems. My poems tend to move in um, sort of little momentary anecdotes um, would be one way to describe a lot of the work I've done in poems. So um, almost, what I started to jump off from were that these sentences I had written seemed to me to be leads into scene. And so I began to write um, just scenes. 
and not think about uh, how they moved in any kind of linear fashion. Um, for one thing, I didn't really know. I didn't know my story. I just knew that there was this woman. I had some guesses about what was going on, um, but I have found that the less I know, the less um, I understand, uh, the more surprise and the more the unfolding yields something greater than my first thought. Um, so if I had a little bit of a sense of why she was there and where the kid was, within a few um, uh, scenes that I began to write, and some of those scenes, I have the book, so I'm gonna show you parts of them. Some of the scenes are tiny, less than a page, like a poem. Um, so here's the very first one, and it's called Magic Boy. So we can see how short a, a section can be. He stands on the chair draped in my red silk shirt, the sleeves knotted around his neck so that it falls a shimmering cape behind him. I am to sit, he's instructed me exactly how I must sit, hands folded, legs crossed at the ankles. Magically, he says, he lifts both his arms, a wooden spoon waves in the air. Like this, he says, his arms in a whiz and a buzz of commotion. I look at him, that sweet face, serious, clever eyes, the ordinary light highlighted by touching his glorious face. Has a mother ever loved a child more? But this is the wrong thing, smiling and looking at him with doting motherly appreciation. Magically, he announces, and he's all business and professional wizardry. We're invisible. I look with mock amazement at my hands, my arms. Oh, forget it. He flares, flipping the magic shirt cape and twirling it so that his back is to me. Magically, 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 he intones. And here the wooden spoon is up again, like a commandment. Magically, he ex exclaims, stern, certain, distant. I am gone. So I, was, I would write that scene and I'd think, where's that going to go? And what I began to do was just write these small scenes and begin to unpack what the relations between this mother and her child is. The story is told in first person, so she was the teller. Um, and I was able to also move in time because she's in a hospital. So she sometimes rises up into the hospital situation where there's a kind of chorus she feels of nurses and doctors who are asking her questions, interrogating her. She really can't speak very much. But so this movement I had, what I began to find is that I was like, accumulated scenes, I was accumulating a range of time. And uh, one of the things that I will say in this is that um, I began to see that my idea that I first had about moving weirdly in time, I was able to do in scene. So I didn't have to have a kind of really radical experimental, maybe even slightly precious way of doing it sentence by sentence and really confusing the reader, I, the reader was going to make these leaps in time with me. I accumulated them. Um, and I think like most people who write books, um, especially first books, I would get up to a scene and then I think, well, what do I do next? I don't know what to do next. Um, and I, with each scene, I printed it out and eventually I started to make folders. And my folders had titles. Um, inside the house, outside the house, um, uh, the playground. So the titles were not arbitrary abstract titles. They were born out of writing scenes where they were inside the house or writing scenes where the mother and the boy went out of the house. And um, when I when I needed to know what to do next, I would look at my folders and I would think, which folder doesn't really have very much in it? So for example, um, early on in one of the scenes inside the house, the mom and the kid who really delight in each other and, and are playing all the time. And she seems to be a, a great mom, kind of inventive and genius with her ideas. Um, they start spying out the window. And what do they spy? They spy the, the kid who's come to mow their lawn. And um, she ruminates on that boy and the fact that her boy will grow up um, to a boy that age. And, and then, I noticed that that actually, that scene could go in two files. 
and it could go in the file that was the file for inside the house, but it could also go in a file that was called the boy and um, the boy. So the boys, suddenly I had a file that nobody else was in but the boy and only one scene was in it. So one day I thought, what do I do next? Well, I thought I need another scene. And I thought the lawn grows back. And if anyone's mowed a lawn, that's the thing. The lawn grows back and somebody's got to mow the lawn again. So I had to bring the boy back and another scene was born. And eventually I had a lot of scenes, certainly not a book's worth. And I began to lay them up on the floor and begin to collage uh, what was going to be an arc of a narrative. And I began to see where I needed more. It wasn't really necessarily needing more towards the end. Sometimes it was needing more in the middle zone. How did we get there? What else is going on? What other possibilities could be born out of that? Um, when I, when the book was later published and I gave kind of the first uh, interview and after a reading, um, I was asked a little bit about the form of the novel and I, um, with real trepidation because it seemed like such a, um, a goofy way to write a novel, such a novice way to write a novel. I explained this and um, the interviewer said, well, wow, that's just what Michael Andache does, a writer whose work I uh, really admire. Um, and he said, in fact, Andache was here two weeks ago and he described his technique in almost the same way that he's collaging the novel. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Well, that's interesting. So it didn't, I didn't have that feeling that you have when you're sometimes writing that what you're doing is fraudulent. Um, in fact, there was a way in which what I was doing really holds true to some of my beliefs, which is a kind of distrust in the linear narrative. Do I love to read books that have a linear narrative? I do. Um, but in some other way, I believe that real emotional truth is ragged and misshapen and, and, and that it needs <clears throat> empty space. It needs omissions. Um, and the collaged form gives you room inside of not just the leaps that you make between sections, but also the white space itself becomes a kind of piece of the novel. Um, could I say I'd planned it that way? I did not. I found my way to it. Um, and I do believe, and I've always taught this to my students, that, that the form and the meaning of a book are inextricable from one another. And you find it um, where I had initially in my um, experimental mode of thinking about the novel, had kind of created a structure before I found my characters, before I found what was the necessities inside of the book. Here, both things were happening simultaneously. Um, I, I think it's a way inside the book of deepening the truth and um, also creating a kind of, um, conf the possibility of conflicting narratives inside of the book that for me, um, uh, the linear tale doesn't do as easily. Now, I think there's also something about each writer, each of us as writers having um, a kind of stamina, not just a stamina, that's not the right word for it. Um, a, a kind of natural way of, um, of managing narrative and uh, whether we exactly like it or not. And I say that because the next go around of the, no the next novel I wrote, um, I, had, I had every intention having, having written a book one way to create a book that was gonna be entirely different, um, formally, really different. And I, I really wanted long, thick, luxurious chapters, um, which I love to read. But in that book, after um, the initial pages in which I started trying to do that, and sort of finding my way into that book, book a novel called The Border of Truth, um, I found that um, 
the, the novel as I was telling it also had a stilted element. And I, I, I thought it was so stilted that I was gonna um, kind of put it aside and see where else I could go with another book. And then um, there was a moment walking down the street um, doing the kind of nothing that, that I do a lot of the time and just sort of letting sentences and um, possibilities of, of things come into my mind about writing or just sort of having been frustrated at the desk writing, um, I walk away to go do something else and the writing kind of um, erupts up. I'm sure this has happened to, to each of you. And as I'm walking down the street, I, I, the sentence pops into my head, which is, dear Eleanor Roosevelt, um, do you like stories? And um, the boy uh, who was central to that, the novel I had been hoping to write, which was in third person, not in first person, having decided I was gonna do everything different than what I had done in Lover Boy. Um, that boy is a 17 year old boy, it's 1940. Um, and I knew something about that story a little bit because I've been working on it. Um, it had uh, elements of my family's history, um, flight from war. Um, it had some elements of, his, of, of actual history embedded that I, were, I was hoping to manage inside the novel. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt um, wasn't, I wasn't intending to have her as a character in the book, but she fits inside of that moment of history in an important place. And I had done a fair amount of research and suddenly I thought, oh, that's his voice. It's this boy who needs to tell this story. It's this 17 year old boy who uh, bombs have landed in his city in Brussels and he's fled with his parents um, out of Brussels in a, in, in a car owned by people he doesn't know. The family has paid their way into the back seat of a car um, saying, we'll pay your gas and food for everyone if, if we can just get out with you. And, um, and, and, and he is, he's not upset to leave Brussels. In fact, he's a 17 year old boy kind of excited about adventure even in the middle of war, maybe especially in the middle of war. So um, some things have happened. And now I suddenly saw that he was, with that sentence, I understood that Eleanor Roosevelt was going to be in some deep way his, the person to whom he confesses. That he needs both her help, which was going to be historically true, but that he also needs uh, for want of a better word, an American mother to tell his um, crime to. And uh, in doing so, I came to understand that the boy, um, just in, in, I knew a few things about the boy and I knew he was on a ship. And um, um, one little fact, which, which had very, very loosely been piece of this book is that this boy, my father had left um, Brussels under very similar circumstances. And I knew that one of the things my father had taken with him uh, when they had to flee the house in 24 hours was his, um, was his new um, compact typewriter in 1940. So that was a kind of prized possession the way we might grab our computers right now if we had to flee. And so I knew that my dad had um, over the many months of, of his flight and escape through Europe and the many things that happened, he held on to this typewriter. And so when that happened, I understood almost immediately with Dear Eleanor Roosevelt that this book was gonna be an epistolary book, that he was gonna write letters. He was gonna obsessively write letters. And so once again, in a strange, weird way, I had created a situation in which I, the writer, um, could just let this boy write letters. And letters, letters can't be so long, right? You know, you've got a limited amount of paper with you. Um, you've got a typewriter ribbon. You've got time to manage, uh, or he's going to have time to manage. And um, they could be really short. And some of these letters are longer. They stretch into some story. And some just implore Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, beseech her to help him. So I began to, again, shape a form in a similar way. Uh, I wrote the letters um, 
sometimes they follow um, in time as he's telling the adventure, but sometimes time messes up the way you would as you were if you were telling someone a story about your flight from somewhere, you may not go day to day to day. Um, you might realize that some piece of what you've told, you need to go back in time to explain. You might need to, you might by mistake leap forward because it seems important. And so once again, I compiled these letters before I knew always or actually um, their order. And um, then just to um, confuse things a little bit, or actually to um, the pleasure of writing, you know, if, if we believe what um, the poet Theodore Rethke says when he says, I learn by going where I have to go. Well, I, that's a kind of a dictum that I have almost pasted over my desk um, in writing. And I believe it, I believe it in how we live our lives, but I also really believe it in writing, that the writing teaches you. The writing makes you braver than, um, certainly makes me, I'll just speak for myself, the writing makes me braver than any of my initial impulses might be. It helps me complicate, it also helps me simplify. So as I was working on this book, which initially I thought, oh, I've got this one, I've got this one all in my head, it's gonna be 150 pages, which is by the way, what I thought the other one was gonna be. Neither of them turned out that way. Um, and it's just going to be an epistolary novel of this 17 year old boy writing letters to Eleanor Roosevelt. And one day while I was writing, um, I had this image of a grown woman in a contemporary situation, not 1940, which is all where those letters were written, but a woman in um, 2003. And I am at, suddenly saw her in New York. You know, the writers talk about that. And sometimes I think, what kind of baloney is that? You saw a woman. But really, I was walking on the way to the library, which is where I brought my computer to, to, to work on this book. And um, I just sort of saw this woman in New York, which is where I live, and that she was the daughter of this boy. I, 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 as I, I suddenly understood it was important for us to understand that there was a life for this boy after and that the novel could kind of maybe move through time in two directions. And when I saw this woman, I understood that she knew almost nothing of her father's story. Um, I think that the many of the, uh, well, maybe I'll say a gross generalization, but here we go. Um, Many of the uh, children of uh, immigrants, which first generation children, which is what I am, um, and particularly many of the first generation children whose families have come from ex extreme situations of violence or war, um, I sort of see, have known um, the people I've spoken to to break down into two camps um, of, of, of situations. And one is the situation where their families talk about it all the time where the where the children, let's say, born here in this country, in America, um, somehow feel that to be their, feel the other country to be their primary home and know the whole story. And on the other side are the are the are the children who um, born here in America and their families want to protect them from all that information and that the job is fully assimilation, you know, just let's get here and let these children be here. And uh, I saw the woman in New York walking as that woman. And so she became a kind of reluctant, for some reasons that aren't worth describing in the telling of this particular talk, she became the reluctant investigator of her father's story. What was so interesting to me then, well, two things. One was, when I first did that, I just had her as like a little piece of lace through the first draft of the book. And I gave the book to my agent and I said, well, I got to tell you, there's this woman in a contemporary woman. He said, what'd you do, Victoria? So I said, just read it. We can always take her out. And um, when he gave me the book back, he said, well, I've got the good news and the bad news for you. And the good news is I really like having her in the book. And the bad news is uh, now you have to write that half of the novel. 
Um, and indeed, in a certain substantial way, as I began to do that, she became the half of the novel. She became the novel's really primary character um, because she is the character that can change in a way, in, 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 in a contemporary way, in, in a way that the boy's story is told and the other story isn't told yet. Um, and so there again, I had moments of time where things could be unknown. I had uh, things that would always remain unknown. And the central question of the book changed. It was no longer about would he get to America or not. The central question began to be when you are, when you love someone, um, do you, when you're in a family and you, and you love your family, do you need to know all the secrets or is some kind of love the most generous thing is to remain, allow that kind of privacy of the past, to allow the challenges that someone has made to get from one place to another to remain something private for them. I would have never guessed in a million years that that was the book I was going to write. But the process of um, working in these chunks, allowing something that I thought was a little piece of lace to then move into larger sections and then to begin to work those sections and see how they, um, uh, like a, not exactly like a puzzle, but um, how they all fit together. I guess it is like a puzzle. Um, so, Working in these ways, in these small scenes and circling around and through one another, it, it, it allows me as a writer into certain mysteries and into unknowns that I couldn't anticipate. And for me, as scary as that is, as much as I would sometimes wish that the way I wrote was really with a straight line and um, a belief in plot, which I don't really have in the same way, um, it allows a book that is larger than my original idea, which is, I said that before. Um, so let me take you to the most recent of the novels, a novel called Before Everything, um, which is this novel. And this book came out in 2017. And so I'll, I'll speak just a little bit about this novel and then, um, as an example, as a further example of, of what I've been describing. So um, uh, with Before Everything, um, the, the, the push for that novel or the initial impulse of that novel uh, was not even a novel, um, it was a memoir. Um, I have had, I had the great, great good fortune of um, having a best friend that I met when I was eight years old and um, she was my best friend for uh, her entire life. And uh, when, um, when she passed away, which she did um, in 2013, so she was in her fifties, um, I, I was speechless, literally. I, 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 uh, had a hard time reading for the first time. And one of the things that my friend had always said is, you know, you should really write about us. You should write about us. And um, how many people have had a friendship that is so continuous? And I said, well, yeah, except a novel needs problems. And sometime while she was dying, she said to me, well, isn't this a problem? So initially I thought, oh, well, maybe I'm gonna write a memoir about friendship. And then, um, I didn't know how to do it. I'm not really a memoirist. Then I thought, oh, I'll tell, I'll write a novel of that. And it'll be in two voices, but two friends. Um, and once again, my original impulse um, changed as, as, as I began to work into it. Um, so I began to write little sections um, from these two different women's points of view sometimes as girls, uh, sometimes as adult women. And I, um, I based it really loosely on my friend and myself. I stole what I wanted from times we'd been together and I invented other times. I invented problems, I invented um, situations. But what I, what I, after I wrote around it for a while, um, I again found that opening. 
Um, and for me, the opening is a kind of a key thing. And um, the opening, uh, this book is written in tons of little chapters. Inside of each chapter are littler chapter, chapters, each with titles. So um, this is the opening of that book. It's called Simply Said, this little section. On a late March day, when you could taste spring's muddy tang, Anna was given the results from the new scans. Anna, who had done it well, actually managed a couple get well miracles, simply said, no more. So um, while I knew intuitively, as soon as I wrote those sentences, that that was the start of the book, I thought, well, that is the dumbest start of a book I've ever heard because um, clearly I've just indicated on the first opening sentence of the book that the character is going to die. Um, so what's, what's the story up until the point of death? Well, that's not <coughs> particularly interesting, really. Um, so I have to figure something else out. So I got a little more interested. Um, and very quickly, I began to write, not just in the voice of um, or it's, it's close third person, not just in, but I, I, I tried, I tried first person, I tried third person, I, I, I moved around, not just in the character Anna's voice, nor the other friend's voice, Helen, <coughs> but pretty quickly, when I thought about these two women or these two girls, I realized that there had always been a larger community and there had been other friends. Um, and Pretty quickly, I began to think about something outside of myself, which was, yes, my friend had died, but my friend was part of a larger set of circles. And maybe there's rings of circles in all of our, <coughs> excuse me, lives and friendships and families. So what, what would happen if I allowed in this novel, how many voices would I allow to crowd into this novel? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, so in fact, by the time the novel was done, there are sections written in over 18 voices. <coughs> so let me tell you what I mean. If what I was suggesting when I wrote Lover Boy was that I could move around in time, here with, with characters that ranged from Anna and Helen, best friends, to some of their other friends, to Anna's ex-husband, to the voice of the medical authorities, to some of her new friends from the community she now lives in, because Helen and Anna don't live in the same town anymore. I had a kind of symphony of voices inside of the book. And what I loved, about that was that I could have that um, moment where a scene would happen where two people would be speaking, uh, would, would, uh, we'd be in the voice of one of the characters as she was doing something and another character across the, at, when that scene was finished, another character across the room could be in her moment thinking about what was going on over there. And so, I was having a kind of symphony, but also it was kaleidoscopic. And would I have ever thought that that was what I was gonna set out to do? I would have never been that brave. And yet the more I wrote into it, the more people started crowding into this book and um, the more exciting it became for me. Because what I began to see was that it was less interesting for me to have a novel about two friends who've known each other over, over a lifetime. But what it is when a person is dying, and in this case, a person chooses to stop treatment, how one person's choice reverberates through a community. Um, but what it also meant, I wanna say this, what it meant inside of this book was a, the move from memoir to fiction and to have all these voices was that it allowed me as a writer to take positions that I would never, never take So, for as a person. So for example, the character of Helen takes a position so entirely different than what I took with my friend. And yet we have all these different voices going. 
Let me give you a quick example and then I think I'm gonna stop. I hope this has made some sense. I feel like I've been talking a mile a minute. <clears throat> so there's a character named Connie. She is, um, actually that's too long a section. Let me find a shorter section. Okay. Um, Helen is speaking in this section. It's called Forever. I'd be lying if I didn't say you looked better. Helen thumbed her, put her thumb into ha Anna's arch. But we'll find our way through this one too. And she pressed her paint stained fingers up the long ropey thread of Anna's shin. No muscle left to squeeze. Her stubby hands pawed wide overlapping Anna's legs. There's only one way through it this time, Helen, Anna said. It's not true, Helen said quickly, but we have all day to figure it out. Anna had been down to bone before, slow walks around the squared antiseptic hallways of hospital units. Anna pitched on a walker saying, really, Helen, this is some serious shit. Helen always had her comeback. Toots, you should have seen your sorry ass a month ago. The truth, capital T, they promised it to each other as children. Easy in the best friend flush at seven or the high romance of 12. A challenge as they got older and the truth felt more wobbly when encouragement was sometimes essential. Helen thought of the buzz and the whir of ICUs. Mornings she'd pleat open her curtain, stand by Anna intubated, sleeping, hey beautiful, Helen would say, you're missing a lot of cool stuff, so get out of here. But forget truth or encouragement, it's vigilance that mattered. And Helen had messed up big time. For years, they'd called each other every day. Even phone messages seemed like contact. The scene continues on from here. The next scene, as she's sitting there with her foot in Helen's arch, massaging her and talking to her, is from a completely different point of view. Dog. Zeus growled. Zeus, the teacup poodle, tangled haired, burr stuck like a tossed off slipper on the floor below Anna. Zeus, out of nowhere, as Helen sat on the blue, blue love seat with Hannah, Zeus looked at her, baring his tiny teeth. So when I wrote that, I realized, oh my gosh, I now have a dog as one of the characters in here. Then there's a, uh, there's, um, the next section is from one of the other friends' points of view. So once again, did I write any of this in a, in a linear fashion? I just wrote sections. I wrote sections. I wrote sections. And then at some point, the floor of the room behind me, probably the floor of the whole house, was covered in sections. And I began to piece together the movements of time so that I was able to go from them as adult women to them as children to them as teenage girls, backwards, forwards, and have other people enter and have other people jump forward in time so that something that gets remembered when they're 40 year old women is a scene that we've seen happen earlier in the novel, but from another person's point of view. And I began to have this movement that was much larger than if I had just told the story, not in a collaged form for me. Again, I think this is a method that might drive some writers completely nuts. Clearly, much as I would like to say to you that this next book I'm writing is in super long chapters, 30 pages a piece and uh, one continuous voice, that's not happening again. I hope that this is somehow helpful to imagining a kind of playfulness. Was there a lot of scenes that got left on the floor and never found their way into the book? Yes. Whereas there, once I sort of created a shape of the book, did I need to then um, fill it out, dilate it out, open it up? Yes. Um, I hope that's a little bit helpful and that you at least play around with it a little bit in some kind of storytelling. Thank you so much.